we now want to establish why does that definition of the Wheeler graph give us the consecutivity property that we would like it to have so that we can do matching like we did in the FM index. So that's what this lecture is about. Um, do Wheeler graphs have the same kind of consecutivity property that enables FM index like matching? We've sort of looked at examples and it looked like it was true. But now that we have the definition under our belt, we can perhaps prove that this is true. It was easy to see that the consecutive, secu consecutivity property held for the Burroughs-Wheeler matrix by construction, because the rows of the Burroughs-Wheeler matrix were just in sorted order. So it made perfect sense that if we have found the, uh, the, the rows that start with a particular prefix, that they would be, that those rows would be consecutive. Now we have to prove something similar, but for the Wheeler graph. Okay. So um, let's think of our algorithm as proceeding in steps, our matching algorithm as proceeding in steps, sort of like we did with the FM index, right? We matched longer and longer suffixes of the text. So let's think of our algorithm as proceeding in steps, and at each step, we are sort of tracking an active subset of the nodes of the graph, right? And so in order to advance from one step to the next, we start with one set of active nodes, we follow outgoing edges from those active nodes that have a particular label matching the next character in our pattern. Then we arrive at, we've, after following those edges, we arrive at a new set of nodes. We'd like to prove that that resulting set of nodes is also consecutive. Right? If the original set was consecutive and we follow all the edges labeled with a particular character, we arrive at a new set of nodes that are also consecutive in the ordering. Okay. In other words, following the edges will never cause the range of nodes that we're tracking to shatter into pieces, right? It'll always, you'll always still have something consecutive. All right, we saw examples previously where this seemed to be the case. So like, for example, given this graph here, if we start, if we say we're going to start by letting the active nodes be all the nodes, and then we follow all the edges labeled A, since A is the shortest uh, non-empty suffix of our pattern. If we follow all the le edges uh, labeled A, then we're going to end up where? Okay, well, we're going to follow this edge, and this edge, and this edge, and this edge. And the set of nodes we're going to get at the destinations of those edges are 1, 2, and 3, and they're consecutive. So that sort of checks out. All right, so one, two, and three, that's consecutive. So uh, then if we were to go another step, right, take the next longer suffix of our pattern, GA, and now let's find all of the, uh, starting from one, two, and three up here, let's follow the ones that have an outgoing edge labeled G. Well, there's two of those, all right? So, oops, there's two of those, right? So I've got A, G, so that's one such path. And then I've got A, G, that's another such path, right? So I've got two of those, and the nodes I end up at are labeled five and six. So again, they're consecutive. Okay, so it appears to be the case, but we want to prove it. And the proof is going to be rooted in those Wheeler graph properties from the previous video. Okay, great. So let's just consider one step in this process. Uh, uh, let's assume, this is basically our induction hypothesis, let's assume that the set of nodes that are currently active, that we're considering, all lie in a consecutive range, i up to j, right? And that's what's shown in green on this diagram. So starting from these nodes, if after advancing by one character, right, following all the outgoing edges labeled with the character c, where c is a variable, so we're following all the outgoing edges labeled c, um, if after advancing we reach a new set of nodes, the red ones, that are all within some new range, i prime up to j prime, can we show that this new range, that the nodes in this new range, consist of exactly and only the, the successors of the edges we followed? Right? There's nothing else in there. So like for example, there's no node in there where um, one could follow an edge with a label other than c and get to that node. Or there's no node in there where you could be outside the original range and follow an edge labeled C and then get there. Right? We want to exclude those possibilities. Okay, So something to note 
about this range um, i prime up to j prime, right? This is, we're just defining it to be the smallest range of nodes that contains all the C successors, all the nodes that we arrive at after following the edges labeled C from the red nodes, right? So let's say, suppose for a moment, even though we're trying to prove this isn't the case, but suppose for a moment that there are some other nodes in there besides the nodes that we arrive at by following uh, the edges labeled C. Um, they would break up the range, but what we're, the way we're defining I prime and J prime is that it's basically the smallest range that you could possibly define that includes all of the C successors, right? So that definition allows for there to be potentially like gaps in the middle, but we're going to prove that they, there can't be. Okay. So the, this is the question we, this is the fact we need to establish that the nodes in I prime up to J prime consist only of the C successors of the nodes in I up to J. All right, so again, here we've got in green our initial range of active nodes, and let's say that after we followed all the outgoing edges labeled C, we got a new set of nodes, the red ones, and the red is showing the smallest range, I prime up to J prime, of nodes that includes all the C successors. Okay, so like for example, there's an edge, you know, maybe there's an edge like from here to here labeled C for example. Right. I haven't drawn the edges, but suppose that um, uh, that's what, that's what the, that's what the, those are the edges, the kinds of edges that we follow to get from the green to the red. Okay, so one thing that we know that's uh, uh, sort of special is that the nodes I prime and J prime themselves must be successors of edges labeled C from the green nodes. They must be, because if one of them was not, then we could have defined the range to be smaller than it was, and that's a contradiction because we defined the range as the minimal such range, right? It's the minimal range I prime up to J prime that includes all the C successors. So it absolutely has to be the case that the first one, the red guy at the top, I prime, the one at I prime, is reachable via an edge labeled C from a node in I up to J. So there's, there's that hypothetical edge right there. And same for J prime, right? It must be, because otherwise we could have made the range smaller, okay? So now, now let's suppose that there is a red node, not the first one or the last one, we established that's, th those are out of the question, but let's say there's some other node in the middle, and that it has incoming edges that are not labeled C, or it, ha it has an incoming edge that is n not labeled C. Rather, it's labeled C prime, where C prime is not equal to C. Right, C, C and C prime are both just variables, but let's, we're using C prime to represent an edge label that isn't C. Okay, suppose this is true. So now let's return to the Wheeler graph rules. The Wheeler graph rules say that for all pairs of edges, if I have two and they're labeled with different characters, then the destination of the one with the alphabetically smaller label has to come before the destination of the one with the alphabetically larger label. So in this case, however, that leads us into a contradiction, basically because um, since x does not come before i prime and j prime does not come before x, and yet i prime and j prime have the same label, that's going to bring us into a contradiction. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So again, recall rule two, if the edge if two edges with different labels have different labels, the edge with the smaller alphabetical label has a destination that's smaller than the edge with the larger alphabetical label. So in this case, since x is not less than i prime, right? x is greater than i prime, right? Since x is not less than i prime, it means the right-hand side is false. That implies the left-hand side must be false. We're sort of doing the implication backwards, right? If the, if the right-hand side of the implication is false, then the only way the implication can hold is if the left-hand side is true, um, is, is, all, sorry, is also false. The only way the implication can hold if the right-hand side is false is that the left-hand side has to be false. So what we're saying is that the right-hand side is, when we compare these two edges, the right-hand side is false. Therefore, we must have that the left-hand side is false, right? which means that C prime can't be less than C. However, we can do that again for these two edges, right? The edge pointing to J prime and the edge pointing to X. Again, uh, since we have that J prime uh, 
is not is not less than x, right? J prime is greater than x. Since J prime is not less than x, then we have the opposite. Right? Again, the left-hand side has to be false, which means that C can't be less than C prime. But if C is prime is not less than C and C is not less than C prime, the only remaining possibility is that they're equal, but that would violate our initial assumption, right? So we've drawn a contradiction. So this is not possible. It's not possible for one of the nodes in the middle of this range to have an incoming edge that's not labeled C. Okay? So that eliminates one important possibility for why our, pro our consecutivity, consecutivity property might not hold. So, okay, we've defended our consecutivity property against one problem. Uh, so now we have to show that another th another possibility also doesn't happen, right? So another possibility that would interfere with our consecutivity property would be if there was another node um, outside of the green nodes that also had an incoming edge to one of the red nodes that was labeled C, right? So that might mean that uh, that, again, might put a little gap in the destinations of the C successors of the red nodes, right? Because there'd be some node that wasn't a red node from outside that range, up here maybe, that has its edge coming in labeled C, and therefore maybe that node is not one of the C successors of the green nodes, but is nonetheless in that range of I prime up to J prime. So we have to show that that's not possible, okay? So again, the question is, could some node X not in the green range, not in I up to J, uh, have an outgoing edge labeled C that goes to one of the nodes in the middle, like uh, let's call it Y, where Y is one of the nodes in the middle of the red range. So the proof idea here is that we're going to do something totally similar to what we did on the previous slide using rule 2 from the Wheeler graph definition, except this time we're going to rule, use rule 3 from the Wheeler graph definition. So looking again at rule 3 here, what rule 3 says is that if you have two edges and they have the same character label, but the source of one comes before the source of the other, then the destination of the first can't come after. But that's exactly what would be happening with these two edges in this example, like this edge, which is this top one is incoming from one of the green nodes. This one is coming from something that's less than the smallest green node. And so they would definitely cross. It definitely would not be the case that the one with the smaller source did not come after the one with the larger source. That would not work. And likewise, if the node was down here, right, after the range i up to j, well, again, for it to point into the middle here, it would have to cross this one, right? So rule three is going to cause us to draw a contradiction. And so we can also show that, that this doesn't happen either. So what we've learned is that when we do follow from the green nodes, when we follow the edges that are labeled um, with C, what we arrive at when we, when we consider the range of nodes I prime up to J prime, uh, that is the minimal such range that includes all those C successors, it's going to include only those C successors. There will not be anything in the middle of that range that is, for example, a non-C successor of any node, you know, as a character other than C, and there won't be a C successor of any other node besides the nodes that are, that are uh, in the original green set of nodes. Okay, so for a consecutive range, i up to j of nodes and some string alpha, let's say we're trying to now expand what we just talked about to the entire matching process, matching each character of a string one by one. All right, so starting from one consecutive range, i up to j of nodes, and given a string alpha, the nodes that we reach by matching the characters of alpha also form a consecutive range. Right? It's essentially, this statement is just expanding the previous statement to be multi-step instead of one step. Right? So instead of proving what we proved about the C successors over the course of one step, we're saying, well, if we do this over several steps, then at every point we'll have a consecutive range. And here the proof idea is to just extend our previous argument to the whole string inductively, right? where the base case is that the original consecutive range that we consider, the, the, the initial range, is all the nodes. Right? So that's clearly a consecutive range. If our range i up to j is inclusive of all the nodes, then obviously that's consecutive. And so that's the first one. That's the one we would start with. And then, just like we did before, 
we would follow the edges that are labeled A, we'd get the A successors of that initial, initial range, that range we've already proved must also be consecutive, and so on. Right, so inductively, we can expand that previous uh, proof so that when we match all the characters of a string at every point, including at the end, we're going to end up with a consecutive range of nodes. Okay, so having now seen what we the graphs are, seen their definition, and seen that that key consecutivity property holds here for Wheeler graphs, what we have to now establish is can we do the matching? Right? In a way, the theory is all in place in the sense that we know that the matching is, has, a, has a similar nature to how we were doing it before, where at every given point we're going to be keeping track of a range of, in this case, nodes. Before it was rows in the Burroughs Wheeler matrix. So we know all that's true, but we need to figure out what are the actual mechanics of doing the matching. Uh, how do we account for the fact that when we do matching in a graph, we have to follow edges, right? unlike what we were doing with the Burroughs-Wheeler matrix. So that's what we'll cover in the next video.